Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the church in Aurora on the first day of spring, although I don't think the weather got the message, right? It is good to gather as the people of God, good to gather in community to worship and experience God together. And I hope that you'll find our worship service both meaningful and relevant for wherever you are on your faith journey. Uh, we've got a few things that are happening in the life of the church, and Reverend Horak is going to keep us all in the loop. Thank you. Change. Isn't it great? <laughs> yes. And you might consider finding out a little bit more about what the Church in Aurora is all about by joining us for a uh, Discover TCIA. TCIA stands for The Church in Aurora. Um, and uh, that is happening today at 1230 in Fellowship Hall, in the Great Hall. We rehearsed this, yes. Um, you know, we really do seek to be a welcoming church, um, but we're also seeking to improve our hospitality process as well uh, so that we can help first-time guests and some, even members to become more fully engaged in the life of our church. Um, welcoming and hospitality is not just the assignment of the greeters or the membership committee, deacons or receptions. It really takes all of us to help people feel comfortable of where they're at. Uh, and that's why the membership committee is uh, offering a one-day hospitality workshop on Saturday, April 2nd, from 9 until 12 noon. And I'm sure there's going to be refreshments probably in there somewhere. Sure. Yes. Um, and again, we hope that you might uh, join us for that. You can sign up online or simply by calling the church office to let us know you're coming. Um, speaking of uh, picking up things, if you ordered a box lunch, um, you can pick those up in the Great Hall. Um, and that is if you have paid for those uh, and ordered them in advance. They don't have extras. Um, you'll have to wait till next year. Uh, so make sure that if you ordered one that you pick those up. Um, for a number of years now, some uh, ladies have been very busy knitting what we call uh, prayer squares. It's a simple uh, token with a, a pretty powerful impact for those who are hurting in some way, shape, or form. And there's a tag attached to each prayer square which simply says, each stitch in this prayer square represents a prayer for you from the church in Aurora. If you know of someone or several who would benefit from these reminders, um, please take uh, one or two or as many as you can, can hold. Um, they are available on the table in the, in the uh, South Chapel as well as in the Great Hall, and we hope that you'll uh, use those. In trying to keep the announcements shorter than the sermon, um, please note a variety of activities that are happening inside and outside of the church that you will read about in your program or online. So, uh, and if you have questions about that, uh, we'll make sure that you have Derek's home phone number uh, as well. Oh, sorry, I went off script again. Um, and let's see what else is in here. Uh, as the offering plates are going to be passed shortly, guests and members alike are encouraged to put in your completed connection card into that tray. And for those of you who indeed are guests, that is offering enough, just your presence being with us this morning. So thank you and, uh, and welcome. And now, uh, segue to a sermon teaser. <laughs> just to clarify also, the fellowship dinners were free. You just had to order them in advance. So unless you want to pay us, we'll always take your money, all right? <laughs> it's good to be in the pulpit after having responsibilities outside of the pulpit a couple of weeks. And, you know, the best laid plans uh, are the ones that God laughs at. Have you heard something like that before? I thought these last two weeks, I'm going to get ahead. I'm going to catch up and get ahead, uh, plan my sermons ahead and all of that. And then uh, life happened. Both kids got sick and were sick for like eight, of, eight days of the last two weeks. And so my plan to ca catch up and get ahead became keep up, right? Just keep up with whatever you, you can. And we've been relatively healthy the last two years. I don't know if it was masks or social distancing or a combination of that, but Wesley was very sick. And I was reminded how helpless you are as a parent to help your sick kid. There's nothing that I can do to make Wesley's sickness go away. So I was, we watched shows together. I gave him the blankets when he needed them. I gave him the medicine when he needed it. And kept the fluids going and gave him whatever he could eat and keep, all right? But I couldn't make the sickness go away. And it, 
in the story, we'll hear about or be reminded of the reality of suffering and how helpless we really are, but how able God really is and how God desires to be present with us and not just be present with us, but he has the power to do something about our suffering. So hang on to that thought as we begin our time of worship together. Kevin, will you lead us in prayer? Please. Oh God, we gather to give thanks for your providence and your care. When our ancestors were in a strange land, you led them from peril and delivered them from persecution. When we face the mountains, the valleys, or the pits of our lives, you are our deliverer and savior. We praise you for your steadfast love that accompanies us throughout our lives. Meet us now as we gather in your name. Amen. I would invite you to rise if you are able as we share in the call to worship and then remain standing as we open with our opening hymn. O oh God, my God, we seek you. Our souls thirst for you. Our spirits long for you. For we are parched and weary in these desert times, these wilderness places. But your love, O oh God, is better even than life. Our actions bless you. Let us seek the Lord where God may be found. Call upon the Holy One who is near. We will bless you as long as we live. We will lift up our hands and call on your name. Amen.
Thank you, and please be seated. Our New Testament scripture lesson this morning is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. And for those of you who would like to follow along in your pew Bibles, that is found on page 903. Let us hear these words of God for us this morning. There were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For those 18 on whom the Tower of Shalom fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you again, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in the vineyard and came seeking fruit of it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it, al let it alone this year until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if it not, after that you can cut it down. Let us give thanks to God for his words to us. Amen. Let us join in one more prayer. Accept these gifts that we offer, gracious God. We dedicate this offering to you, the giver of all good gifts, and we pray that it would be a scattering of seeds in good and fertile soil. Use both the work of our hands and the giving of our resources so that the gospel may bloom and its roots grow deep, both in this place and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? God of generous provision, we are grateful for the many ways you care for us and provide for the needs of your people. In word and water, bread and wine, you nourish us and sustain us. When we listen to you, we encounter delight. 
and when we come to you, we live most fully. However, sometimes we find ourselves in a dry and weary land, in places torn apart by war. We think especially of our siblings in Ukraine, where the earth itself has been ravaged, where hospitals and homes and schools and corner stores and theaters have been reduced to rubble, where human lives have been deformed, where peace lies in the ruins and hope is buried. O oh God, raise up peace again. Build hope from the ground. Restore in us and in the world's leaders the will and determination to make an end of war and a new beginning for justice. Sometimes we find ourselves in a dry and weary land when we are lost, unable to find our way to a place that is home for us, when we are sad and weighed down with regret or grief, when we are tired or sick in body, mind, or spirit. Oh God, provide water in the desert and manna in the wilderness, enough to sustain us for one more day, even enough to revive us for the long haul. And God, sometimes we find ourselves in the rich feast of your presence, when we celebrate a new beginning in our lives, a new job or a new relationship, a new life, a new day of sobriety, a second chance. Oh God, we give thanks to you for this new blessing in our lives. Sometimes we find ourselves again in the rich feast of your presence, when we give thanks for the gift of healing after injury or illness, for laughter that bubbles up to replace our tears, for hope that spills its soothing light over the darkness of, it, of our despair. God, we thank you for the gift of wholeness and resurrection promised in Jesus. And we lift to you now, quietly in our hearts, all the things that have been weighing on our hearts and minds, knowing that you can hear our prayers. Be patient with us, we pray, in the varied landscape of our lives. Make us patient with one another and with ourselves. Do your good work within us, among us, and beyond us until our lives and all of creation come fully into your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand and we'll sing, I want Jesus to walk with me. It's an insert in your bulletin.
and you can be seated. We're going to be hearing about Moses' call to deliver the people of God from the hands of the Egyptians. It's a familiar story. And I've said before, it's hard to preach about familiar stories because we come with our own, um, I don't know, pre-assumptions about the story from hearing it before. If you don't know the story of Moses, I'll catch you up just quickly to where we're going to start. Moses was born a Hebrew during the time when the Hebrew people were enslaved by the Egyptians and there was an edict from the Pharaoh to uh, kill every, every Hebrew boy to as to control the population. He was afraid that the Hebrews were going to get too populated and then be able to take over. So in an effort to save Moses, his mother takes him down to a river and there uh, puts him in a basket and he is discovered by the daughter of the Pharaoh. And so Moses is taken then and raised as Egyptian royalty. He's a Hebrew, but being raised by the Egyptian in the Pharaoh's home. As an adult, Moses witnesses an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew, and he goes and he kills the Egyptian, buries him in the sand, and flees to Midian in the desert where he finds a a wife and settles down and has children, and he takes up his father-in-law's business of tending to sheep. And that's where we pick up in the story in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why this bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And he responded, here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be your sign to you that is I who have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they said, what's his name? Then what should I tell them? I am who I am, God responds. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, So say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Friends, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Moses is going about his business, like he does every day, tending to the sheep of his father-in-law, And he's finding pasture for them to eat and be nourished and nurtured. But this day, Moses strays from what would have been the typical boundaries of the family farm. And he goes to the far side of the wilderness. And he comes upon Mount Horeb, where later Moses would ascend 
to receive the Ten Commandments, where Moses would strike a rock and have water flow from it. And out of the corner of his eye, he catches a glimpse of something aglow, and he's drawn to the light. Have you ever been about your ordinary business and stumbled across something extraordinary, something that drew your attention, that raised your curiosity? Have you wandered into a metaphorical wilderness and encountered the divine in a way that spoke to you? It's hard to imagine that Moses was out looking for something so profound. I wonder if he was wandering through the wilderness, perhaps unintentionally, going as far as he did, consumed with the thoughts racing through his mind that he had at one time committed murder, that he had fled his people, that his people continued to suffer. And when Moses needed it most, God shows up. The enslaved Hebrew people suffered under the Egyptians' hands, just as the Galileans that we heard about in the New Testament reading suffered as Pilate mingled their blood with the blood of other sacrifices. Those who were killed by the Tower of Siloam suffered a brutal tragedy, and it just paints the picture of reality for humanity, that suffering is real. It is part of our world. And knowing that suffering is common doesn't make it any easier to bear. When any one of us is suffering, our whole world shrinks down to us, doesn't it? When Wesley was sick, he didn't care about anything else except for him getting better in time for the sunshine. He kept saying, am I going to be better Thursday, Dad? Thursday, it's supposed to be nice. Am I going to be better Thursday? His world shrunk just like ours does. Our world shrinks when we suffer. It's difficult to see the truth that we suffer when we are suffering. It's not super comforting to know that others suffer the same or similar plights when we're in the middle of our own darkness. In suffering, the expanse of humanity collapses down to the individual. In our struggle, we might ask the holy question, why? Why now? Why is this happening to me? Why? It's a question without answers, for sure, underlying our own helplessness and suffering. But we still ask. And the question mirrors Good Friday and the, and the questions that Jesus asked on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In our suffering, it is easy to feel alone, but we are far from it. God has always been and will always be with us in our agonizing moments. There's no doubt that Moses was suffering when he stumbled upon that burning bush, struggling with his own demons, lamenting that he had left his suffering community behind. And he's, as he agonized, God shows up. As Moses approaches the bush, he gets a glimpse of God's heart, and, and we all do. God's heart is breaking for his people. God is deeply concerned that God's people are being broken and their spirits are in despair. God says, I've observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry. I know their suffering. So I have come down to raise them up from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land. As I prepared for my sermon this week, the idea of God coming down and raising us up stood out. That God would come down to raise up God's people who are suffering. This is who God is. We serve a God who comes down to meet us right where we are in our darkness, but not leave us there, to raise us up into a new land, into a new season. And he doesn't just do it here with the burning bush. It's been happening since the beginning of creation when God's spirit came down to hover over the waters that were in chaos and he would raise them up into order and beauty. When Adam and Eve would break the covenant, God would come down and offer grace and hope. When humans were so broken, God came down in the form of an ark to raise up humanity to a new promise. And even after Moses would deliver 
God's people, they would be wandering in the desert and God would come down in the form of a cloud by day and a fire by night to raise them up into the promised land. Throughout the prophets, God's presence, God's presence comes down to raise the people up. And as we know, God would most memorably come down in the form of one of us as Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, to raise us up from slavery once and for all. Again and again, out of love and compassion, God sees us, God knows us, and God comes down to raise us up. This is who God is, and he says as much, I am who I am, beyond our comprehension, beyond our world, and yet God takes note of us and takes every means possible, including becoming one of us, to raise us up from our suffering. Here with Moses, God becomes a burning bush so that this message, this word of hope, might be proclaimed. And this word of hope may seem like a Christian or religious cliche <clears throat> to some folks who are in the middle of their suffering. One must experience this reality in their soul, in their bodies, and throughout their lives. Like Moses, there have been times when my mind has wandered. Yours ever do that? And it spins out of control sometimes. And we end up in the desert of our minds or the wilderness of our minds. And I begin to question myself or I begin to wonder, is this what I should be doing? Should I be in ministry? Should I be in the church? And every time, without fail, I will get a text message, a phone call, a letter or a card saying, hang in there, or this is how you've touched my life, or whatever. A, a small burning bush to remind me that God is present in my dark moments. Tracking God down is no small task. And we all know how rare an actual burning bush is. But there are more subtle burning bushes everywhere. And God always seems to be trying to get a hold of us. Little fires aglow with God's presence, glowing with the radiance of the Spirit's nearness. Messages of hope and strength and solidarity abound in our world. So I was wondering about you. Where have these little fires been in your life? What messages from God have you clung to? When have you encountered a burning bush, subtle or extraordinary? Have you felt the embers of God's self in the hand of a friend who's traveled far to be with you in a season of despair? Did you sense God nudging you toward a nap on a rough day, or did someone whisper or send a word of encouragement? God said to Moses and the Hebrew people, I am who I am, meaning I am a God who sees you, who knows you, who loves you, and I can't help but be there for you. Our God comes down and walks with us through those valleys of death and raises us up in the darkest of nights. Suffer what we may, God is our companion, and God will never leave or forsake us. God, even in death, will wrap the spirit around us as he did with Christ in the depths of the tomb and raise us up to light and life unending. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 3 of our final hymn, Beams of Heaven as I Go.
Friends, receive this blessing. Go out into the world to join God in the work of love, of peace, and of justice. Take in the breath of life. Take off your shoes and know that you are ever in the presence of the holy and living God. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.